I told my mom and she said that I was absolutely insane. I, we barely have money to take you to a you know, Moldovan university. You want to go to the United States, pay $40,000 tuition, $70,000 tuition a year. Like, what, what, like how are you going to do this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to. And I just like had this fire out of my ass. Like I knew that like there's going to be a way. I just, I just knew that I'm going to figure it out eventually, but I'm just going to do all the steps as if I'm going. Hey guys, what's up? Uh, it is Evelina here. And today I will be sharing my story of how I moved to America. I realize I've never shared the story and it's a really good freaking story like I I'd like to like think about that when I'm feeling down or I feel like I'm losing my purpose or I feel like I'm not capable of doing something because what happened in my life that brought me here at 19 years old by myself leaving my whole family behind and everything that's happened in my life was truly a miracle you know it really got me thinking what was it what was it that really made me enjoy making content? It wasn't the tutorials, it wasn't like showing how, you know, amazing, organized, talented, just multicultural I am. It was just genuinely me being vulnerable, putting myself out there, allowing the possibility of people saying mean things based on, you know, me putting out my character out there, but I had the courage to do it and I didn't care. And there was people that just genuinely enjoyed watching my content for me. And then the more I sort of went in my own head, I just kind of distanced myself from people and started more doing my own, you know, tutorials and things that like, here's a little piece of me, but like you don't get to really know me. And I realized like, yeah, that's true. If you are candid and honest and you share things about your life online, there's gonna be bad people who are gonna watch your videos, who are gonna wanna hate you, who are gonna wanna go after you, but that's just life in general. You know, being vulnerable is so valuable in the way that you're able to build relationships with people. So I'm back and I'm gonna try to actually be vulnerable because I think my sort of barrier of not allowing myself to like be myself has really just been dumb. So anyways, let's get into the story. It's a really crazy freaking story. So let's go. All right, let me take you guys down a memory lane. I got my family album right here. So I was born in Russia. Um, most of you guys already know this. My mom is Moldovan, my dad is Russian. And um, we lived there for the first six years of uh, me being alive. And uh, right around when I was about to go to kindergarten, we moved to Moldova because my mom just was having health issues there with like the climate and it was too cold and all those things. So um, we decided to make the move to Moldova. And this was like, I want to say 1996 or so, which was a very interesting time in history. Um, I don't remember like everything, but I do remember sort of the post-Soviet, uh, post-communist situation uh, sort of all over like Eastern Europe and mainly the countries that were uh, fallen from the Soviet Union. Basically Moldova was part of the Soviet Union and Russia was the Soviet Union and then when everything collapsed, like imagine this, you live in your country that just overnight you get the announcement that the country doesn't exist anymore so basically the whole system is down. All the laws that were in effect before are no longer there, um, any protection that you have from the government is no longer there, like everybody's out, everybody's done and now like y'all figure it out basically. Um, like the craziest thing was when the currency, which was the ruble, you know, it was sort of the currency across all the countries, uh, fell down. Like it, the currency was no longer a valid currency, so now people that have saved up their savings and their money, um, everything that they've had is worth zero it's worth absolutely nothing so so it's a really interesting time and also an exciting time because nobody knew how it's gonna go you know is this gonna be a good thing does that mean that now you know moldova has independence and now we're gonna strive uh to a better future or like what's gonna happen to us nobody knew so uh people were sort of trying to start their own businesses trying to like figure it out and during this time while the sort of lawlessness was happening. A lot of uh, mafia 
groups were kind of starting to operate all around Moldova and Russia and Ukraine and all those places. It was just basically if, you know, somebody had a business, they could come in at any time into your business and be like, if you don't pay us this much money, you're not going to be in business. But if you do, we're going to protect you. You know, like typical mobster shit. So my dad was a very talented car mechanic, car engineer. Like he was amazing at his job. So he decided to open um, like a car repair shop and the business was going really well. You know, it kind of prompted my mom to sort of take me and put me in this really nice uh, private school, which were all the like the government kids were going to basically, or just like all the I guess the elite of Moldova we're going to and besides the fact that was probably the coolest thing that my mom did because I had the most incredible experience in school and the people that I went to school with are all so kind, so intelligent, like they were all went to do great things. Like some of them work for Facebook and, and they're all over the world. So being in that school was definitely very instrumental to my education and being able to like make something out of myself. So. It's very expensive though. So we had our business and it was going really well. It was growing, like we were comfortable um, until somebody from, uh, which we call like a Novoroski, it's like from the mobster mafia people, whatever, came into my dad's shop and he said, they said exactly that. If you're not gonna pay us um, this much money every month, we're gonna crush you. So my dad couldn't do it because it was too much money and then the business would just go under anyway. So we just closed shop. So my mom bought me all these outfits, like she bought me this really cute red coat that I loved so much, you know. I was little, I was like, this was for first grade to go first day to school. And I had the cutest outfits, like my mom went above and beyond and bought me like, I, I literally looked, not gonna lie, like my parents were, you know, British royalty or something. It was like so over the top and ridiculous. And then this whole business stuff happened, you know, like it all fell down and now it's like my mom has a teacher salary, which a teacher salary in um, Eastern Europe or in Moldova, let me just not speak for everybody else. Um, you don't get paid by the hour, you get paid per month. So at the time her salary was $200 a month. And I think it went up like a little bit over the years, but you don't make any more than $100, $200 per month. Um, that is the regular salary. And I feel like a lot of people don't know that. So suddenly we're hit with like well shit like what are we gonna do and my dad sort of started drinking um you know things like really went south for my family like my my parents relationship deteriorated very much like life a home just sort of became a nightmare like everybody was under so much stress and sort of as the years went by um i kept wearing the same coat to school you know because and I kept growing out of it. So like once the coat was like over my knees, by the time I was in fourth or fifth grade, like the sleeves were up to here, but I was still wearing that same coat because we didn't have money to buy a new one, you know? And I'll never forget my best friend at the time. She was like, are you gonna stop wearing this coat? You know, I was just like, stop wearing it. Like you're always wearing the same thing. And I wish I would have, told her I'm like bitch with what money but I was just like you know as kids we kind of internalize things and we don't stand up for ourselves so anyways I mean it was hard for a lot of people back then because here in America if you work hard and you try your best and you just you know push hard you can actually uh, take care of yourself and and do something for yourself whereas like both of my pa my parents were working their asses off on uh, my mom was making like a hundred to two hundred dollars a month which is a teacher's salary in Moldova so it was like how do you you know how do you make things work like there were there were times where like we just we didn't even have food um, I remember like my mom cried because I, I stole some bread from the cafeteria and I brought it home and I was like here mom and she just like broke down that was like so sad for her by the way I don't want to get you into like this like super sad sub story it's like millions and millions of people live like that and they that's how they live and that that's that's how they like they have to survive that's what they have to do that's that happens you know on top of kind of you know trying to like struggle through like an old uh, post-communist regime and like trying to like rebuild the country and all that um for the next like two decades basically the only presidents that we had were like 
just people who are so corrupted and like just destroyed the economy and like destroyed any future that Moldova would have. It, w it was crazy, you know, like I remember in the winter, like it's it gets really cold there. So it's like out of nowhere, they would just decide to turn off the heating, you know, they would decide to turn off the hot water or electricity. Like there's been so many times where I would do my homework just um, at the candlelight and it's just something that you kind of get used to after a while. and. You still have to pay your utilities, but you know, they decide they want to do it, whatever reason that is, whether they want to save money or torture people, I don't know. But it was really tough, you know, these are things that it's like since I moved here, I forget how crazy it is to live in parts of the world where you in many ways don't have control of like what's gonna happen to you and like your future. It's like you just have to try to survive. I was kind of going down a weird path in like my teenage years. I sort of made this like big friend group or kind of like the, the street hood rats basically. Uh, we would just like gather all in this like abandoned kindergarten and like a big gazebo all year round. Like we were there just smoking, drinking, you know, whatever rebellious teenagers do or whatever. I also didn't grow up religious or anything. Like my mom never really like made me go to church. Like I kind of like had my own beliefs, you know, my whole life uh, up until that point. And one time it was winter, it was like freezing and we're all like, why are we there? You know, if you look back at it, we're just like shaking, freezing in our boots. Like some people have like a cigarette in their hands and they're like shaking in the winter and it's like, just go home. But I think like so many of us had sort of an unstable like situation at home that we would rather be outside and freeze than like be at home, which is sad. So anyways, um, one day somebody came up, uh, what, somebody from our group came up to us and they're like, hey, I heard that there's this church across the street and they have free cookies and free tea. Like, let's just go hang out there and like be warm instead of be here. We're like, all right. Like the first like few weeks that we went, we would just like make fun of it, like whatever, like ha ha ha, like we would all like, uh, people would just um, turn off their, or what's it called, like turn off their cigarettes or like throw their cigarettes like right before walking into church and like, all right, let's go, let's sit this through or whatever. And um, as the months went by, people kind of stopped going there, but like I was the last person standing. I just like didn't want to stop going. I'm like, I don't want to be fake. I'm, like I, I want to like see what these people have to say. So slowly, um, my heart started changing. I started really like actually listening to the preacher and like developed my relationship with God and uh, my whole life changed, you know? I remember I hung out with these people for like years and years and th these people were my world until one day I just came there and I, I just told them like, I'm just letting you know that like I'm not, I'm not gonna be coming back here anymore. Like I'm taking a different route in life. So I wish you guys good luck and I'm out. While I was at church, this was about like, I was like 15, 16 years old. And our church was kind of running a lot of like uh, charity and ministries and things like that. And um, which would bring uh, teams of Americans to Moldova. And by the way, there's really not much of a tourism industry in Moldova. It's not like, it's not also very diverse. Like nobody really comes to Moldova unless they're either, um, you know, doing a charity work or, or doing something that's not pleasure related, if that makes sense. So I decided to get involved with these Americans. I was over the moon when I met like the first group of Americans. I thought they were the coolest people in the, in the world. I was like, oh my God, like, like it's like in movies and I felt like I was in a movie and like my English was so bad like it was so bad and I was like practicing and trying so hard to like make them think that I was cool you know and then um I just loved being around them I loved how like vibrant they were how like people would laugh and make jokes and they were just so like high on life like Americans were so like smiling all the time and I'm like wait that's so cool like I, I'm so used to just people like being sad Nobody's smiling at each other. You kind of follow the rules, like keep your head down. Like as you know, culturally, like in Russia, Eastern Europe, like you don't really smile at strangers. Like, like you're considered crazy if you do that. It's like supposed to be something that's only for like, if something's really funny or somebody that you trust, you know? And eventually through the work we're doing, I found something that I was actually really passionate about, which was working with orphan kids. So uh, we would go and do these summer camps at orphanages, like in North of Moldova. Um, Little parenthesis, there's a lot of orphan children in Moldova. Like it's actually like, like 
one of the highest numbers in the world, like as far as I know, or at least in Europe. Like the problem is insane. Like there's so many kids without parents just everywhere and no one takes care of them. And then they throw them in these like orphanages, which are run horribly. And it's just like a sad situation to see these children, you know? So that was probably one of the most rewarding things, you know, to go to those orphanages. Like the Americans would bring a shit ton of toys. And for like two weeks we would, um, play with them, you know, help them, teach them classes, hang out with them, just show them like somebody cares about them. By the way, my job there was to be a translator, which my English was so freaking bad, but I really wanted to do it. I'm like, well, if there's a way to learn, I'm just gonna do it. I would always just translate out of my ass. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if like what I'm saying is actually correct, but like, I'm just gonna do it anyways. As it went on, my English got like quite a bit better. Like I feel like that's how I learned by just like going in and like pretending I speak English and just using my brain really hard to try to like piece things together. I was kind of shadowing like this guy, like I was like following him around and like translating for him. He was like this older gentleman in like his maybe 40s, like early 50s. Um, he was a dad, he like had a family in the US and like, we sort of like, as we were working together, like he would ask me all these questions and it's like, well, what do you want to do in the future? Like, what do you want to do? What do you, what, what are you thinking? Um, how's the education system in Moldova and all this stuff. And I told him, I was like, you know, I, I'm so happy when I'm around Americans. Like I'm so happy with people who just are so joyful and like high energy. And like, it just seems like you, you have it together. Like it would, be my biggest life dream to like go and study in America one day, you know? And we talked a little bit here and there and we just sort of left it at that. As I came home, this like fire got lit up in my ass. I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to go and study in America. I want to experience this. I want a better future for myself. I want to be in a country where I feel safe. I feel like there's a future, like something that, you know, I could provide for my my mom back home for my struggling relatives and like help everybody because if I stay here I'm either just gonna be like everyone else and not live you know a happy life or I'm gonna get the chance to actually make something of myself you know I told my mom and she said that I was absolutely insane I, we barely have money to take you to a you know Moldovan university you want to go to the United States pay $40,000 tuition, $70,000 tuition a year. Like, what, what, like, how are you gonna do this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, I just feel like I'm going to. And I just like had this fire out of my ass. Like I knew that like there's gonna be a way. I just, I just knew that I'm gonna figure it out eventually, but I'm just gonna do all the steps as if I'm going. I started researching. I started Googling. We didn't have internet at my house because it was like super expensive. Um, so I would go to an internet cafe after school. You pay like a few lei or like half a dollar for like an hour and like you can use the computer. So every day after school, I would go to the internet cafe and research what colleges, what's, what do you need? What paperwork do you need? What kind of tests do you have to do? How much money do you need? What's a scholarship? What is this? What is that? How do you... What, how do you apply? What is an application? You know, all this stuff, like just myself, like writing everything down, you know. Meanwhile, working on my English and the way that I um, learned English, I feel like, yes, I learned a big portion in school, but not nearly enough to where I was fluent. Like I would just uh, buy books in English or I would ask like Americans to send me books from America in English. And I would just sit there for hours and read from you know, morning to night or whenever I had time, I would just read out loud so I could like perfect my diction and my accent and whatever words I didn't know, I would like write them down, look them through the dictionary, then try to memorize them, then keep reading and keep reading. Like that's basically how I taught myself. So anyways, about a year goes by and now it's like time to, you know, really starting to um, send in my application and like figure out what's going to happen to me. So I reached out to my dad. He um, had already moved to Russia. My parents had been separated for quite some time. And I told him, like, I need a little bit of Christmas money. You know, don't ask me why. I just need a little bit of money. He sent me $100. I used my Christmas money, which is all I had was $100 to pay the application fees to um, different colleges. So like, I only had enough money for three schools. And I just followed all the directions. I did everything. I went and got notarized, got my grades, got everything that I could possibly need. And I just like, went and applied and sent in my application. 
the first college got back to me and the only way that I would be able to go is if I would get like either a full ride um, scholarship or a sponsor or something like that. And my only hope for that college was to get on the cheer team because I was doing dance at the time. So maybe I'd get a cheer scholarship, an immigrant scholarship. I don't know. So I got accepted into the school, but they said they were not they don't have any scholarship money for me. So. I just remember I felt so devastated. I like cried for all these hours. Like my, I was crushed. I was like, no, this can't be like, this can't be like, that's it. Like all this work and like, it's just going to be a no. I started researching some more and I found this other college that was um, a Christian school. Um, it's Pensacola Christian College and it was cheap. I think it was like $8,000. Yeah, it was like eight grand a year, which for American college standards is nothing like it was the cheapest school But the reason why it was so cheap is that because it was kind of like the super crazy conservative school Like the number one most conservative school in America and when I say conservative I don't mean that they vote Republican like you could not touch the opposite sex You had separate elevators for men and women you had a dress code with long skirts like that shit was wild like intense type of rules, you know, and if you break something you get this like points against you called demerits and if you get to 150 demerits home that's it you're you're kicked out of the school and I was like okay well that sounds crazy but what if uh, I go there because it's cheap and it looks beautiful they had a beautiful campus so I send everything in and at this point I'm just waiting you know waiting to get an answer like what's gonna happen like what like am I gonna get accepted are they gonna give me a full ride scholarship like what's gonna happen and I remember getting this it was like summer and I remember getting this like thick packet of documents that came from Moldova uh, from America and like I just like took them in my hand and I'm like oh my god like this is like this was in America and came to me and these are like American documents from an American school like that's so cool and like I was just opening and I couldn't believe my eyes you know I got accepted and like and they sent me all my like student orientation as if like I was already going to be part of it and I'm just like holy shit like I'm going to America that's crazy so I tell my mom and she got so upset she was like uh, first of all I'm an only child so to her like to see me go is like devastating to her and second she's like w with what money like you're gonna miss all the deadlines to apply to Moldovan universities and you're just not gonna have school like my mom was so dramatic she's like stop it give up you you have a crate you have these crazy ideas just stop it and I was just like so you know like heartbroken about it I remember I took like a piece of paper and like I wrote it um, I mean, this is a little cheesy, but like it helped me at the time. I just wrote like, don't let anybody take away your dream. It's not theirs. It's yours. And like I put it on my wall, like on my door for my mom to like, you know, see that. I took a year of uh, English classes to pass the TOEFL test, which TOEFL is like a super difficult English test for um, international students. It's like a four hour test that you have to pass. And based on that score, uh, you can then apply to schools. And I was just doing everything that I needed to do. And like getting that packet is like the affirmation. It's like, here it is, you know, except one small detail, where am I gonna get the money? So then I remembered this friendship that I had with this man, um, obviously it was a platonic friendship, like he had a wife and kids and like, he was just more like a mentor, like a father figure. Like we like, he really kind of helped me and like navigate through like, that experience while we were in summer camp and those things. And I was just like, you know what? What do I have to lose? <laughs> I wrote him and his wife a long letter of like, why I wanna come to America, what I wanna do, why I want an education and how I did everything. And like now I'm accepted, but my parents can't afford to pay for my education. I attached my acceptance letter and then I attached my uh, college essay that I wrote, which was like super like cheesy. So I put that together and just sent it over and was kind of hoping for the best. And a week goes by, I don't hear anything. A couple weeks go by, about a month goes by. I don't remember, it was like maybe like two months that I haven't heard from them. I was just starting to get really sad and anxious because people were getting ready to go to like university, you know, it's already like beginning of August, you know, since like, and I still don't have money to go to school in like a couple of weeks. And I'll never forget that morning that changed my life completely. 
I woke up, went to the internet cafe and um, opened my email and there was the reply from um, Troy, that, that was his name. He said, my wife and I um, prayed about what you wrote in the letter. Uh, congratulations for getting accepted. We kind of like prayed about it and really like wanted to see if like this is something that we should help with and we kind of felt led by God that we should help you and uh, we're gonna give you ten thousand dollars <laughs> okay anyway sorry it was just crazy um I said I, I don't want to cry but it's like crazy he's like we're gonna give you ten thousand dollars for your first year of college because we want you to get a good education and Oh my god, I was so happy. It was like the happiest thing in my life. I just, I came home and I told my mom, I was like, Mom, Mom, I'm going, I'm leaving. Like, it's happening, you know? Like, he's like, where did you get $10,000 from? I'm like, I don't know, this family is helping me out. And it was like the happiest, most insane thing that happened. And my mom finally came to terms with it. And once it was time for me to leave, she uh, took a thousand dollar loan from the bank to buy my airplane ticket. We bought a one way airplane ticket, which was $800. And she gave me $200 as my pocket money. That's it. That's all I had. I remember getting on the plane and like, I didn't even know how to put my seatbelt on. Like this guy next to me was like, kind of looking at me, like watching me struggle. And I was just like, oh fuck, fuck, fuck. Everybody's gonna know. I don't know how to put a seatbelt on. Oh my God, oh my God. And he just goes on like, does this. And I'm like, oh, that's how you do it. I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so anyways, I got to my school about a week earlier than everybody else. And I did not know anything about dorm life. I didn't know that how prepared you're supposed to be. I didn't know all the shit that people bring. I thought that I'm gonna come with my little suitcase and my clothes. I had like a tiny little suitcase. Um, it's gonna be like summer camp, you know? They have like bed sheets, they feed you, like there's everything there, I just have to go. Um, small detail, the $200 that my mom gave me, I spent it in a couple days just buying stuff at Charlotte, Charlotte Ruse and Claire's and Hot Topic and by the time I got to school I had zero dollars left. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> so anyways, I get there. My roommates aren't there yet. Um, the dorm room's completely empty. The beds are just plastic mattresses and the thermostat is locked. So you cannot adjust the temperature. You can't call somebody to come adjust the temperature because nobody's there. So basically, I don't have a car. I don't know anybody. I don't have a friend. I don't have a family to go to Walmart, nothing. So I just slept on a naked mattress for that week, it was so cold because of that thermostat that I got so incredibly sick. Like I just remember like shivering, you know, like I put like as many clothes on myself as I could and just like waiting till my roommates were gonna get there so I can like beg somebody to like take me to Walmart. And um, anyways, my roommates got there, we got to Walmart, my dad sent me another $100 and I bought one blanket, one sheet, and that's all the stuff that I had. And that doesn't sound like much, but I was just so happy to be there. Like, it meant everything to me. It was like the biggest miracle of my life that I arrived there. I didn't care that I didn't even have a blanket, that I didn't even have warm clothes, that I had no money to buy books. So I would have to go and like make photocopies in the library with like all the pages so I can be prepared. Because when I found out every book is like a hundred bucks, like I could never afford that. It's nice to look back and remember where I came from and remember how much it meant to me and how badly I wanted something and how I did everything regardless of every stops and everything that everyone else has told me. How I just had faith and I just kept going and it worked out. You can do anything. You can do you can set your mind to it and you can do it and you can accomplish it. And I hope that this inspires you guys in some ways. Uh, don't give up hope, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you want, keep at it, keep doing it. Pretend that it has already happened and all you have to do is just follow the steps and make it happen and it's going to happen. I look at the state of the country and the world right now and I'll be honest with you guys, it makes me sad when people say, 
all these terrible things about America and don't realize or understand, which I guess it's not their fault, but they don't realize how how much hope this country symbolizes for some people that come here with zero dollars and make something out of themselves and support their families and escape horrible communist regimes and, and economic situations and persecution. And it's like America has always been that place where people can come and, and become somebody. So I hope and pray for the future that, you know, things are going to get better. But it just saddens me to see that people don't appreciate, you know, the privilege that is to be born here. And me coming here as an immigrant, you know, the things that I've been able to do and accomplish and just all the amazing, wonderful opportunities I've had since I have moved here. Uh, I'll never stop being grateful for that. I can't. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this up because this is going to be like two hours long. Um, I hope that this was interesting or useful or inspiring in some ways. I love you guys so much. Um, thank you for still coming back to my channel and supporting me. And I hope that this kind of breaks the ice a little bit to where we can have a more, you know, personal sort of back and forth relationship. So yeah. Anyways, I love you guys. I will see you in my next video. Bye.